basically what I want to present to you is what we're thinking about from BSF's perspective and how are we equipping our lab to be able to look at these types of problems. So to start, this slide again, we, uh, we talked a lot over the past two days of various different techniques. So again, looking at solid amorphous dispersions, when you're looking at formulations that are formulated into a tablet, when you have very large polymers and very small surfactants and systems that are inherently complex, uh, we have drug that precipitates over time. We have, um, uh, that, well, we're preventing, we're trying to prevent it from precipitating over time, but ultimately these, these systems are, are very complex by themselves. And then this morning we talked about lipid-based systems where now you have an oil phase and you have these cloudy mixtures and it can be really, really challenging to actually measure how much drug is coming out. So again, uh, just as Professor Klein had shown, Here's our, our standard USB 2 apparatus, and I can tell you, for having given a lot of lab tours, this is always a, everybody in this room is very familiar with this type of apparatus, but I always find it interesting when you bring uh, non-pharmaceutical people into a lab and you say, look, this is how we actually test whether your tablets are going to work or not. And they say, what? This is completely irrelevant for how a human body looks at, but uh, uh, ultimately, is this good enough to test for complex systems? I think it works very well when we're testing uh, uh, ibuprofen tablets, but now when we have these solid amorphous dispersions, we have these lipid-based systems, it really uh, does not represent what we're trying to find. Uh, so again, here's your ADME model, and basically some of the many aspects that we need to start looking at in order to accurately monitor what's going on. So our supersaturation, our dissolution behavior, our precipitation inhibition, and our absorption. So these are some of the, the broad stroke categories that we're trying to uh, uh, look at when we're trying to find more bio-relevant testing media, mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, just methods in general. So again, we. Uh, already talked about the USB-1, USB-2 tests, and, and really that this was intended for quality control type work, but is not necessarily representative of uh, a real in vivo setup. And we see this time and time again over the past two days, a tremendous amount of examples of why this is uh, uh, not accurate. And just for the sake of um, completeness, I think this is the uh, eighth time you've seen that, that square <laughs> for the past two days, so I've been keeping count. <laughs> Uh, another interesting part of this is the hydrodynamics of this. A uh, uh, long time ago, back in graduate school, we had a number of people that were working on this piece of it, and the mixing in something even very simple like this, this, cyl this cylindrical uh, media is quite complex, and whether the tablet or, or the soft gel is sitting on its side or sitting over a little bit in a different uh, uh, mixing zone can really change some of the results as well. So once you uh, add that complexity to a complex system, now this gets quite um, crazy. So looking at bio-relevant um, uh, dissolution tests, so factors that are influencing the supersaturation of these formulations. So again, we've, we've already touched on a lot of these, so in the interest of time, um, so we can get to the panel, I'll go very quickly through these. Gastric emptying, permeability, ionization characteristics of the API, uh, the, the influence of micellization and bile acids, and, and how we not only form micelles with, with the solubilizers that we're using, but how do those form uh, complex micelle type units once they're in the gas fluid. And then factors influencing precipitation. Again, pH change, GI fluid, digestion of the solubilizers. So again, even the solubilizers and surfactants are subject to lipolysis and other digestion type uh, things. And then the nature of the excipients. Uh, so in order to look at these, um, uh, Professor Klein touched on the transfer models. We have done a little bit of work on this, and here's just a, a quick example of how this works. So you have your donor phase, and then you have your acceptor phase, and a pump in between. So you're moving from, from a, a, a more stomach representative unit into one that mimics more the small intestine. Uh, it's, a, it's a great model, but ultimately we're also not really looking at absorption and how that changes the setup as well. So looking at how that uh, works from an absorption standpoint, this looks quite familiar to anybody who worked on skin-based products. So this is basically very similar to a Franz-type cell, where now you have a donor compound. So in a skin example, you would use a cream, but in this example, you would use your, your uh, biorelevant media and your, your uh, uh, drug, and this is basically penetrating through this uh, proprietary membrane, this permeopad, and now you're measuring drug content over time. Now this can also, depending on how you design the system, can look at things like precipitation as well, and you can add various different ways to mix the system to see if uh, your drug is going to work in, in, in these types of systems. Um, 
Monica shared this slide yesterday at the very beginning. This is the Sirius Inform, and this is a unit that we have in our lab now. It's really the backbone of our dissolution measurements. And again, this, is, this presentation today is in, uh, intended to be introductory as to what we're doing in our lab to try and tackle this uh, uh, way of advanced dissolution testing. So again, for, for whatever reason, I have a strong affinity for robotic type systems, and that's basically how this machine works. It's, it's a bit... Um, smaller than the one that we use for the high throughput formulation work, and this fits on a, a desktop. It's made by Sirius, and uh, it's a UK-based company. And you can do a number of different things, bio-relevant dissolution, lipolysis, precipitation kinetics, uh, biphasic dissolution, and uh, high throughput screening of things. So it's very small. You have, again, these, uh, these are little tiny beakers here, and there's a robotic arm that picks them up and moves them around. And over here is basically the cell, and I think I have this on this slide here. So this is basically what the cell looks like. Again, you're looking at different pHs. You have a UV probe and a stir, and uh, you can use inert gases if needed. You can control for temperature. And also you can do some more advanced things like uh, adding second phases to it. So this is one of the units that we just recently installed in our lab over the past couple of months, and we've been getting some really interesting data on this, looking at different solubilizers and different types of systems. Uh, so here's just an example. This is... Uh, more similar to uh, what Ferdinand had presented earlier. So this is just a very quick example. We talked about a soft gel formulation. So in this case, this is basically what you would find inside a standard peg-filled soft gel. So this is 500 microliters of uh, polyethylene glycol, four, uh, molecular weight 400. So here's your drug. This is Danazol, which we've heard about quite a bit over the past couple days. It's a nice model compound. So here's what happens when you run the Sirius Inform with uh, PEG-400 saturated with drug. Now you use a traditional solubilizer, and very quickly you see that spring model. Here's your RH40. Very quickly you see the drug spike and then come crashing down. And then when you use something like a polymer that has a strong influence on crystallization inhibition, you get the nice long parachute. So this is just an example of some of the data that we're getting with this system. We're just finishing up a very nice set of data looking at and screening different crystallization inhibitors with a couple of different model compounds under a couple of different pH conditions. So look for that over the course of the next couple of months to come out. Looking at it from a bioirrelevant uh, dissolution test, now we add a second layer here. So you can use octanol, and in many cases we're using nonanol. This is added after about 30 minutes, and you can actually measure through two different UV probes the uh, concentration of drug in the oil phase and, and in the water phase and under stirred conditions. So here's just a very quick example of that, again, using a similar drug. Here's uh, your aqueous phase up until about a half an hour. At this point, the machine adds the nonanol phase and, and titrates it, and then you can very quickly see the drug very rapidly jumping into the oil phase, and then the aqueous phase, it, it coming back down. So this is just another way to improve upon and, and look at uh, a more advanced type of dissolution apparatus. Um, <clears throat> again, looking at it from another perspective, this is a similar system, although in this case we're using Soluplus uh, and Danazol. It's a 20 to 80 percent weight. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, an amorphous dispersion in this case. So you're seeing a much more controlled aqueous solubility. And then once the nonanol is added, you can see again uh, uh, still retaining a, a fair amount of drug now in the aqueous phase and then a, a slow growth within the solvent phase as well. So completely different when you compare it versus the previous slide where the drug immediately jumps into the oil phase and now looking at it from this perspective, you're still retaining and growing in the aqueous phase. So the Plus is really helping to keep that in there. <clears throat> Uh, moving to something a bit more complicated, this is the lipolysis model, and this is something that we're actually uh, uh, installing in the lab more or less now, so we don't have a lot of data on this type of thing, but now you're looking at a couple of compartment models similar to a transfer-like, and now you're, you're keeping uh, also some of the enzymatic activity in order to monitor lipolysis behavior and to be able to combine this with some of the other systems that we have to monitor when we look at these SEDS and SMEDS formulations to see how uh, the drug is going to ultimately behave. Uh, this is one step, uh, in, in my opinion, maybe a bit too far. We don't have this system at uh, BSF, but I've used this in the past. This is the TIM system, and it's it's so inherently complex that you're now covering all of these different sections of, of the body. I remember uh, about a decade ago, the first time we did this type of experiment, uh, using a blender to add um, 
basically scrambled eggs, bacon, and orange juice into the stomach container. And uh, some of the, com the disadvantages of using a super complex system like this is you can't figure out where your drug is going. And sometimes you add up all of these different ports of injection and you're finding where your drug is and you end up with only 30% drug even though you're positive, you know how much you put in there. So I think that we can try and mimic a human body uh, in an in vitro type setup, but ultimately we want to try and keep it simple enough that it tells us the story, but not beyond what is necessary. So in our case, we're trying to split the problem into smaller chunks that we can uh, handle a bit easier. Uh, and we, we went over this with the previous talk, so these are uh, more compendial media type things, and, the, and these are some of the bio-relevant media. So in the interest of time, we will jump uh, forward into the panel type session. But I just wanted to give you a taste of what here at BSF we're looking at from a bio-relevant standpoint. And a lot of the expertise that we have in solid amorphous dispersions and in lipid-based systems, we now have to test them on adequate systems to try and prove what's actually going on and have a mechanistic understanding of how some of these excipients are playing in the final dosage forms. BASF. We create chemistry.